I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Jonathan Rosenthal today to our show. Thanks for having me, Dr. Mala and, and Cliff. I've been practicing for about 23 years now. I was trained in internal medicine and I've worked my entire career as a hospitalist. So I take care of people in the hospital, purely in that setting. So generally people who are pretty sick, I work in the ICU, but I also take care of all, all different kinds of patients, in, including hospice patients. I, I deal a lot with patients that are dying from different things. And of course, mental illness is a huge part of what I see every day as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the unique components, of course, is where you're located. So would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yeah. I, yeah. I live in Kauai, uh, which is a smaller island. One of the, there's kind of four main islands of Hawaii. Oahu is where most people live, and Kauai is a very kind of rural setting. It's about 65,000 people total on the whole island, and there's one major hospital there. There's a one critical access hospital as well, and so I've been working there now for about almost 13 years in my current role. Wonderful, wonderful. So what inspired you to work as a hospitalist and also to locate yourself in a pretty significantly rural area? Yeah, so as far as being a hospitalist, it was sort of a natural fit after doing residency because when you do your residency, at least certainly where I trained, which was a pretty inpatient centric program, you're very well equipped to kind of just keep doing the same job, but just as a attending physician rather than a training position. I finished residency in 2003 mm -hmm. and it was a almost completely brand new field. It had only been around for about five years, maybe total. The whole concept of a hospitalist was very kind of new. I didn't really know that that would be my career. I think I figured it was just an easy transition. I would do it for a little while. A couple of my good friends from residency had done it the year before. So I went to work with them, which was really you know nice to be able to do that. And then after me, people I worked with came to join the next year. So in a few years, we had this group of people that had all trained together. Mm -hmm. And, and then we all worked together and then the program grew from six people when I joined to now, now after I've, I've been gone from that program for a while, but it has like 60. And when I left, I think it had 30. So lots of growth in that area. And then the second part of your question, as far as the rural part, I never thought I would practice in a rural environment really, because I was in Seattle for the first 10 years of my career in a very urban environment. And the reason I moved to Kauai was really just because of it's a great place to live. And it wasn't so much that I wanted to practice in a rural setting. I didn't really know what that would be like, but I, I actually really, really like it. I mean, it has its challenges for sure, mm -hmm. which I will complain about from time to time. But, you know, I think the flip side is that, you know, everybody after a while mm -hmm. and, and what you do is really appreciated. You really feel like you're part of the community. And so it can be quite rewarding in that way. Wonderful. What does a hospitalist do for those who don't know? If you go to the emergency room, usually it's from the emergency room, the doctor there will see you. And if they decide you need to be admitted to the hospital or you can't go home, then they would call me. And then I come down and see you in the emergency room. And occasionally I might say, well, actually, I don't know that you have to come in. Let's try to do this at home. But usually we're all in agreement. And, and then I will admit the patient and maybe just overnight for observation, or maybe they're clearly super sick. They go to the ICU on a ventilator or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. They have surgery. Like I, I see a lot of surgical patients kind of co-managing with the surgeons. Mm -hmm. And then I'll round on you every day until you leave the hospital. Either I will or my partner will. So we trade off kind of back and forth. So we don't, obviously we don't work every day, but we do like a week at a time. So there's some continuity there. Right. And your team. So like the team of hospitalists that are there on island, is that a fairly large team, a small team? What does that look like? We have eight total positions that are available. And right now we kind of have a core of six that have been there a long time. Mm -hmm. By a long time, I mean, probably about 10 years, mm -hmm. at least some have been there almost 20 years. And then the other two spots seem to kind of never be filled. They, mm -hmm. they kind of people come and go, we have moonlighters, mm -hmm. but at, at any given time, there's three during the day and one at night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of you are essentially the small group of you are essentially carrying the entire island and the care for that island and those who come in. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of crazy when you think about it that mm -hmm, way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have other specialists and we have other, you know, but yeah, I mean, for the hospitalized patients, yeah. That's right. Good. What are some of the concerns that you have with, you know, what are you seeing? What are the trends of some of the main issues that you see on island? Mm -hmm. I mean, from a public health standpoint, the two biggest are the uh, metabolic disorder 
epidemic, right? You know, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, we call that the, the metabolic syndrome. That's a huge problem everywhere. And it's a huge problem here. The second probably biggest problem I see is methamphetamine use. I mean, I don't know what to compare it to, but it's really rampant here. Mm. I mean, to the point where when I first started working, I mentioned to a social worker, I said, you know, I don't see as much meth use as I thought I would see. And she said, that's because you're not looking hard enough. <laughs> and then I started testing people, even like old people. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away that like how frequently you would come across people who are using methamphetamine and it often leads to problems that I need to see them for. So stroke, mm -hmm. specifically hemorrhagic stroke in young people, which is can be a completely life-changing event. Heart attacks, cardiomyopathy, random infections, all kinds of stuff. But I mean, it's every day I have at least a couple people who have something to do with methamphetamine as to why they're in the hospital. When you work with this population that comes in having used meth or even on, you know, the other issue in the epidemic of a metabolic disorder, essentially using sugar, you know, as yeah. it becomes spice. Yeah. What are some of the stories and the concerns that people end up sharing with you as to how they're using, why they're using, what compels them to use? What are you hearing? Well, for the meth, I'll answer the methamphetamine one first, because I'll be honest, it affects their brain chemistry so much that I don't ever have a very meaningful conversation with them about it. And I've sort of to the point, I mean, sadly, we don't have any resources here for zero. So if they were to tell me, which they never do, if they were to tell me, I really want to quit, can you help me quit? I wouldn't be able to really answer their question. I, we have a social worker. If they really are motivated, she can meet with them and, and perhaps give them some resources, but it requires usually travel to another, to Oahu resources. There's nothing that the community can provide mm -hmm. for these people that that is helpful. There's no public, as far as I can tell, there's zero public health energy spent on this problem. Uh, I don't know, you know, it's illegal. They don't probably even arrest most of them because what's the point? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's terrible, you know. And now the other one, the metabolic syndrome, I have a lot more hope for. I mean, that's kind of what my wife works on and is an expert in. And I actually, <laughs> I just put on today my nice continuous glucose. Yep, monitor. yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I'm curious to see how that works. But um, that problem's a lot easier to deal with because the patients want to be helped. Mm -hmm. At least some of them do, you know. And so you have to have buy in from the patient, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah, it's sort of an addiction to bad food as opposed to a drug, but it doesn't affect your brain chemistry to make you, I mean, honestly, some of these people who have been using meth for so long, like you can't, you can't get through to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's really kind of sad. So then what does treatment look like for you when you have patients who come in having used meth and there being very little hope? You mean in the hospital or afterwards? Both, both. I was going to get to afterwards, but yeah. Now yeah. that you mentioned, I mean, in the hospital, in the hospital, you deal with the acute medical problems and then you just level with them. I'll try to sit down with them usually on the day that they're leaving mm -hmm. and explain to them, make it clear to them that that's why they're in the hospital because of this drug they're using. And that the only way that they're really going to be able to live a long time is to stop using it. And, and I certainly try not to just like lecture them. But that's not the approach I take, mm -hmm. but like, I mean, there might be an occasional younger person where they just kind of made a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. They still have family that loves them. And, and you might feel that, yeah, they can probably get on the right track. But a lot of the people don't have any family anymore. They're kind of like almost homeless or maybe they're homeless, maybe they're not. Mm -hmm. and yeah, There's really, not even anyone else there in the hospital to talk to. It, it, it's so sad. And um, we're trying to facilitate access to care for behavioral health and the right place for care is not the emergency room and yet we see that so much we have an md on our advisory board at rehabrecovery.com uh, he's worked in a small rural town and they had one patient who had 93 visits to the er in a calendar year for wow. substance use disorder this was yeah. alcohol but dr rosenthal if you could estimate like take a stab at it, you probably don't have access to data right now. What percent of the folks coming in to the ER care are 
someone that's under the influence of something. Is that extremely common? But as far as a percentage, uh, under 40, it's maybe 80%. Old people, it's almost zero, right? So it really depends on the age. I'll give you an example. So like if I see my list of patients in the morning and they're all new to me, I don't know who they are. Almost every single time, if you have to be hospitalized and you're under 40, maybe 90% of the time you have some sort of substance abuse and or mental health, usually both problem mm -hmm. accompanying whatever else is going on. Occasionally it's someone who just has some terrible disease that they got when they were young, but it's almost always like, okay, is this person on meth or are they bipolar and homeless or schizophrenic or like, why are you mm -hmm. know, why is a 36 year old in the hospital? And you probably see a lot of those are probably recurring visitors, right? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend people look for in terms of recognizing signs and symptoms of use? How do you think the family members and the general population could do better in a rural setting to recognize signs and symptoms? Yeah, that's sort of a tough one. I mean, I think certainly if they've ever had to be hospitalized for anything, that's a huge red flag. Mm -hmm. And so like, if you're a parent and you really don't know what's going on with your child, but you find out they've been hospitalized, that would be a big warning. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be one, I guess. I mean, obviously erratic behavior, getting into fights, uh, stuff like that, not being able to keep a job. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because it's hard to deal with the root cause if the root cause of them ending up in the ER is an addiction issue, right? A substance use disorder issue. You might be treating them for the broken leg that's associated with that, right? Which is a secondary thing. And you mentioned it earlier, Dr. Rosenthal, it's one of those things where it's extremely difficult to get someone help if they don't acknowledge there's a problem. Mm -hmm. In those remote areas, sometimes it's really difficult to get care. If someone did say, I think I have a problem with substance use disorder. I drank too much. This happened because I was intoxicated. Can I get help? What type of options are there? And do you have good partnerships? I'm really curious. I mean, you're not going to like my answer, but no, we don't have anything. Yeah. yeah. We have nothing. Zero. We had one psychiatrist who specialized in alcohol addiction, and he unfortunately passed away from cancer last year, two years ago. And, you know, so he had stopped practicing shortly before that, and no one has replaced him. So it's basically if they have a family, you can work with the family. And, you know, that can be helpful, but a lot of them have already burned those bridges. And mm -hmm. so they don't have anyone to help them or they have an alcoholic partner who's not going to help them. Mm -hmm. And so it's really sad. I mean, it's just like, it's just really sad. It's demoralizing and it would be great if we had some kind of resource that we could refer them to. Yeah. Well, as a provider, so that, you know, that answers that question in terms of, you know, wanting for resources how do you cope with what you're seeing and the influx of individuals who fall into this affliction? I mean, how do I personally cope with it? Personally, professionally? Yeah. I, I just try to focus on the ones that I can help. And I guess I'm sort of ashamed to admit it, but it is a coping mechanism. You just don't give a lot of thought to the ones yeah. that you can't help because, you know, it's kind of a protective mechanism. That's, of course, yeah. um, the training, the training yeah. part of the training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's, and I don't know if you've heard doctors speak kind of when no one's around, but you kind of dehumanize them to some point, you know, just talk about, oh, some meth head, you don't mention their name. And I think the reason we do that is because we don't want to feel that sadness mm -hmm. you know, that's there. Yeah. 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 Dr. Rosenthal, I'm, I'm, I'm in long-term recovery myself. I'm comfortable saying I'm a recovering alcoholic or even a recovered alcoholic. Most people today say they substance use disorder, alcohol, and I use a 12 step program of recovery. And this goes back to 1939, right? When the book was written and the 12 steps were first introduced, it's a wonderful program. Historically, a lot of times there would be people that wanted to sponsor and help others who were struggling who would try and form partnerships, relationships with hospitals, with primary care physicians. Do you know if there are even 12-step resources available for meetings? 
There are, yeah, I know that they do have that. And so we can, I mean, I think the social worker will refer people to that. And, and sometimes that's quite helpful. You know, I think it depends on the, you know, I have had several patients say, oh, I, you know, I tried that. I don't like it. It's not for me or whatever. Um, I mean, obviously, I think most people are aware of that program, maybe at number one, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I know, I know that it's here on the island in person. And I think they also have online meetings. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. So in terms of online, you mentioned that, like, are there resources from a virtual perspective also that you could offer? As far as virtual resources, off the top of my head, no, there's not. And I know that there, well, I don't even know if the social worker, because I work with her closely, even has any. Um, and so I should actually talk to her about that. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're homeless, it's not really an option. But for other people, not, like, not everyone's homeless. I think there's a huge role for that in the near future, right? I mean, I think more and more people are used to having appointments online for whatever it mm -hmm. is. It's not that weird of a thing co compared to how it was before COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it would be great to have that as a resource, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it sounds like also the concept of integration, and I think that's a really great one to talk about within the hospital system, certainly to provide care while in checked in, but also then after you've been discharged. What does that look like? And you're mentioning the social worker, like, is there any type of communication where you can provide, you can say, listen, this is what I recommend. Let's see what resources we can gather or utilize or point them towards to be able to give them not only integrated care, but also integrated aftercare. I mean, I think part of the problem is usually like if they're going through DTs and they're in the hospital for that, that's a very serious illness. Yes. And even when they're ready to be discharged, they're not really doing that great. And so, and unfortunately we can't keep them there for a long time, mm -hmm. right? Like once they're medically cleared, they kind of have to be discharged mm -hmm. because our hospital is always full almost. And so. I think the time to do that wouldn't be necessarily right then. Like, what are the chances? Like, they're kind of half with it. Their brain's not even working that great. Mm -hmm. And they're supposed to go navigate that. It doesn't seem super realistic. It seems like the best thing would be have them be discharged with family or friends or somebody mm -hmm. that can kind of give them some support. And then once they, you know, in a week or two after they've been in the hospital, would probably be the better time for them to realistically be signing up for some kind of online program or something. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, like they're usually still relatively sick when they're leaving. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe I think it would require someone helping them. Like if, if they're just alone, I don't see that working out too well, but maybe the next day, once they get home and, you know, get situated, they could, their friend or whoever they live with or somebody who's helping them could go ahead and sign them up for it. And they could have their first appointment the next day. I think that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that the, the, ER is used sometimes as a detox facility. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, what's really common is that they go through detox and especially alcohol, right? Very, very dangerous to withdraw, right? It can be fatal. And that anyone going through DTs is, is a very sick person, right? Uh, with, with acute alcoholism. And then they are withdrawn. And after three or four days, what happens, unfortunately, most of the time is they go home. And where they're home in their home environment with their normal triggers in everyday life, usually they are back using very, very soon, right? If we did have the optimal resources in place, the right guide, the right partner, they would go to a residential treatment facility, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's the level of care that really is appropriate for someone who is that sick or a partial hospitalization, right? Or intensive outpatient and in so many environments, uh, that level of care is not available. Mm -hmm. Or it had been private pay, mm -hmm. right? What, one encouraging thing is that these levels of care, we are seeing positive changes with payers and even Medicaid now, uh, there, there will be access to that level of care residential. But if we don't do that, the odds of someone who is that sick getting into recovery, going home to their normal home environment, it's less than 1%. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. So. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I had read, I think it was a New Yorker piece a few years ago about these expensive 
90 day programs that cost upwards of what 50 to a hundred thousand dollars or something. It said they don't publish their, their rates of success, but this guy, this journalist, I can't remember if it was a guy or, or a woman, but whoever the author was had tracked down some data and said it was greater than 90% uh, relapse within a year of the people that went through those programs. Uh, and that seemed pretty discouraging to me. Hmm. Yeah, the data, there's not great outcomes data in substance use disorder and I think behavioral health in general. <laughs> the one correlation that is valid is length of time in treatment. And uh, the longer time you have in treatment, the greater the outcome. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also intent, right? When someone does want to yeah. live a life of sobriety and get into recovery, uh, we work with many premium facilities that have historically been private pay that are very expensive. Unfortunately, uh, they're available only to a subset of the population. That is changing too. But there are real good recovery rates for those even 30 day programs, 60 day programs, 90 day programs. But as you know, doctor, there has to be a desire and a willingness. Right. And, and back to the 12 steps. Step one admitted we were powerless, that our lives had become unmanageable until someone surrenders and says, you know, I, I have to change the way I'm living. Nothing's going to happen. Right. And I think, you know, unfortunately, you see this firsthand. There's a degree of hopelessness when people's lives are, are really, really messed up and they they kind of give up and, and they lose hope that there's a chance for something better. It's really sad and, and it's really difficult. Um, access to care, though, it is it is getting better. You're you're in a unique situation. You are literally on an island. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit different where you are but we, we are seeing improvements. Yeah. Yeah. To that point, you know, the recovery rate, as you said, Cliff is very dependent on willingness and intent to move through and navigate through recovery, whatever that journey may bring. And, and so on an Island, what do we say, right? We say addiction and substance use disorder is a disease of isolation, right? Mm -hmm. And we're on an Island. So, you know, so it's like, the factors are, are definitely building that do not work in, in your favor. And I think to that end, my question is, what are some common misconceptions or myths surrounding this issue that you think need to be addressed, Dr. Rosenthal? The entire issue of substance abuse or the access to care part? Oh, it's all of the above. Yeah. Well, I think the brain chemistry part is is important to emphasize because there's more and more research coming out about that, especially well with any substance, but especially methamphetamine, where it clearly changes your brain chemistry. And so you have to understand that the person you're talking to isn't thinking or, or acting the way you would think they would, right? Mm -hmm. and they're not, the same. and if you knew them before, they're not the same person. And so I think when you're trying to figure out how to help them, you can't expect them to act the, the way that maybe you would think like a quote, normal person would act, you know, they're not going to respond to that necessarily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In economics, they use the term rational actor mm -hmm. and, and we don't have a rational actor there, right? No. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm a firm believer of if you're looking at public health, it's all about incentives, right? And what are we incentivizing and what are we not incentivizing? And, that will guide human behavior. Mm -hmm. We need to come up with some sort of public health system that will incentivize people to get clean and stay clean and to be healthy in general. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Incentivizing that I think is something that isn't necessarily prominent, I would say in this area, you know, I think there's a lot of incentivization towards that, which can let us fall into vices and bad habits. I find it interesting, and this is a question that I have for you being in a rural environment, like, is the general focus of health and wellness something that is prominent and let's just say less expensive even, is it accessible or is it inaccessible? Is it hard to reach? You know, for example, good organic healthy foods, hobbies that can be positively reinforcing that are healthy for us, you know, things like that. I feel that in the United States in general, we have 
a little bit of a limit with getting to these things, whereas in other countries and cultures, they are emphasized a little bit more. So what are your thoughts and, and what's your experience in a rural environment with this? You know, Kauai is pretty unique in that we, we kind of have like the, it's kind of like a barbell shape of public health. It's like we have the very unhealthy, typical, they might happen to be Hawaiian or Filipino or white or whatever ethnicity, but they're kind of like the typical American unhealthy people, mm. you know, eating potato chips and fried chicken and pasta and rice and soda and not exercising. And they're generally, they don't make much money. So it's really hard for them to pass McDonald's up for a salad that costs twice as much, right? right? right. And then you have the other end of the spectrum, which are these health nuts, uh, a lot of Japanese people and a lot of wealthier people who are super into health, who do yoga every day and are vegetarian and never, you know, eat any processed food. And so I think the life expectancy in Kauai is, a, is one of the highest in the country, if not the highest really? in the country. Wow. But it, that kind of masks this subset of the population that's still quite unhealthy. Mm -hmm. But I think it's encouraging because so much of it is like, like it's a small enough community where I feel like personally I could make a difference if, if given a chance, you know. I mean, one of my goals longer term is to basically quit the job I have now or, or go to half time or something so that I can focus on something related to this issue, which would be trying to get people healthier. Mm -hmm. And like one easy low hanging fruit would be have the cafeteria at the hospital have healthy food, which right now, you know, they sell just junk food basically to and, and everyone who eats there is either a patient or an employee and the employees are insured same as the patients, all by the same health insurer wow. who basically pays the hospital. So it's like, what are, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> like, like you're making a couple extra bucks selling this cheap, gross food at the cafeteria so that you can pay 10 times that in healthcare costs down the road. Mm -hmm. So even financially, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. What kind of message does that send for the community? It sends the message that what you eat isn't important uh, to your health, yeah. which is ridiculous. Yeah. I think there's things that you could do teaching people how to cook healthy with like everyone here shops at Costco. So like you go to Costco and you, you can show them, Hey, for this budget, this is what you can buy. And this is what you can make that is easy and healthy and can replace what you're eating every day. Things like that can make a huge difference. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, getting these, these, these continuous glucose monitors, if you, if you can get one for free and stick it on someone for two weeks and have them engage with it, it, it really is, powerful because it's one thing to say, oh, you're eating junk. It's another thing to actually eat junk and then watch the number go up by a hundred points mm -hmm. on your phone mm -hmm. and go, oh, and then realize I don't feel very good right now and say, oh, okay. yeah. like that actually helps change behavior. Ongoing, yeah. ongoing, like data, you know, that you can see yeah, and feedback. Yeah. Yeah. The feedback is important, which I didn't, I didn't really used to understand like biofeedback, what that means, but it's, it is. It is helpful and it is important. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rosenthal, you, you, you talked about the uh, metabolic syndrome, mm -hmm. right? And we talked about that kind of the differences with some of your patients in, in that group versus patients with substance use disorder. And you talked about a willingness and a desire. Could you expand on that? Do you see those people kind of acknowledging that I understand that I've become sick because of lifestyle? What type of effort do you see to make those changes? Because even, you know, changing habits is hard, right? Mm -hmm. and when you're used to eating a certain way and eating certain things, and a lot of this food is designed so you have cravings for it, right? With mm -hmm. sugar and salt mm -hmm. and fats. Talk about that a little bit. And I'd love to hear your thoughts too on is that recovery, right? Do you put that in that category? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, I would put it in the category of recovery because it's something you have to work at every day. It's never going to just go away. Right. Um, and the, the answer is, or the key is, yeah, it's looking at it that way. It's not, you have to change how you live every day. You can't just be on a diet for a month and then go back to what you were doing. Just like you can't quit alcohol for a month and then go back to drinking. I feel like more and more I've seen that, like a lot of different patients who come in the hospital for whatever reason with metabolic syndrome. And I see a lot that are doing better. And I, I don't exactly know. I mean, I think that's because their primary care doctors are helping them. Um, maybe there's are a lot of community resources. Uh, maybe there's just more education out there about eating healthy. But you know, the, the hemoglobin A1C is the main measure we use. And 
I'll see them go from 12, which is terrible, to seven, which is really well controlled, you know, below seven. And, you know, I always make sure I congratulate them and they feel much better and they lose weight and they look better and they're healthier. So I definitely see, have been seeing that. I feel like more and more, I mean, I don't track the data of it personally, but that is actually one of the things that our kind of screwed up health system has actually done right is, is they really focus on that hemoglobin A1C number and they incentivize doctors to get it down. Um, now that I think about it, we used to have people check their blood sugar four times a day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's not necessary. I mean, you can do it like for a week or two to get an idea of what happens when you eat certain baseline. things. Yep. Yeah. Baseline. If you have the continuous monitor, you can wear that for a week or two, but, but the A1C is measured every three months. And so just the fact that we do it that way kind of shows that this is a marathon, mm-hmm. right? It's not a sprint. You have to change your whole life style to really get that number down. Right. It's not going to happen in a week. That's encouraging. Maybe you've seen the bottom and, and there's a turnaround and the incidence is less and that, that's really encouraging. We don't hear a lot of encouraging news, right, in, in this area. So thanks for sharing that. Are there support groups for people in that group, right, where they can connect with other people? Like similarity is so important, right, that I'm not the only one that's struggling with this. Is there the opportunity to do that together? Person, not that I'm aware of, and and even online, I'm sure there are online uh, resources, which I'm not very familiar with, but I think, I mean, and part of it, I would love to start them on that if I knew what to, to refer them to, but to be honest, a lot of that is up to their primary care doctor because that's who's going to be seeing them every couple of weeks and every month. And, you know, I might see this person once or a couple of days and that's mm-hmm. it. And not to say I don't have any responsibility, but... It's something that requires repetitive kind of reinforcement, right? And that's yeah, really something I can prof- provide. Yeah, not the hospitalist, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. right? Yeah, not not generally. Now we do have, I have patients that I see more often than their primary care doctor sees because they're in the hospital all the time. And so for those occasional patients, I do develop a relationship where I could do that, but that's outside of the normal. Mm-hmm. Are there any emerging trends or advancements that you find particularly exciting or promising? You mentioned the glucose monitor. What other mm-hmm. things have you seen that excite you, especially for you know supporting a rural community like you are? Sure, there's a lot of stuff out there. I mean, we just went to this anti-aging medicine conference for people that want to live to be 120 or whatever, but they want to live healthy. But that, that has spurred this whole industry. And I think some of that will trickle down to the people that wouldn't, be labeled as such a the kind of person that would go to that conference, but they still might get a benefit mm-hmm. from it. You know, for example, more sophisticated testing, blood testing mm-hmm. to figure out really what is your metabolism. Right. Like the typical doctor now checks a lipid panel mm-hmm. and a hemoglobin A1C, and that's about mm-hmm. it. But there's a lot of other things you can measure that give you more sophisticated, a more sophisticated look at really what their metabolism metabolism's doing. You can track that again over time with diet changes and show them that they're, you know, getting healthier and and those are linked to Mm long-term benefits. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Do you see more of that happening, you know, where we're testing blood metabolism and how you're metabolizing certain medications and things like that? And how, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we're just starting to, uh, just the tip of the iceberg, really. Mm -hmm. I think in the next 10 to 20 years, it'll be a huge change. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. For example, they have a test for uh, a genetic analysis to see what antidepressants and antipsychotics you would respond yeah. to. And there's several several companies that do mm-hmm. that. My first experience using that recently, and you know, it's not perfect, I don't think, but it is, I mean, literally before it was just blind luck, mm-hmm. like, oh, try this and hope it works, you know, and, and you never really know who's going to respond to what. And so getting more sophisticated testing for that is very promising. The genetic stuff applies to all across the board, mm-hmm. right? Like any, anything you're treating, but specifically for for psychotropic medications, antidepressants yeah. and anxiety medication and, and antipsychotics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're hearing a lot about personalized and or precision medicine, mm-hmm. right? Where it's going to be customized to a degree based on your genetic makeup and your blood. It, it is really interesting. And Dr. Rosenthal, the, the interest in longevity for people that how can we, uh, you know, extend uh, th- this thing called life. Uh, are you familiar with the Blue Zones? 
Mm -hmm. where, where they found these six or seven pockets throughout the world where people have much longer long longevity. And if I recall correctly, I think the big correlation there was strength of personal relationships. Mm -hmm. Was that right? Yeah, that's what I recall. Yeah. Like Okinawa was one. And that's right. Uh, yeah. That was the takeaway point is they ate different foods and they had different levels of activity, but they all had strong, however you measure that, they all had strong personal kind of, I, th I think they found a lot of meaning in their life or they maybe, maybe you could call it a low stress life or whatever you want to call it. But you do see that on Kauai. I mean, like I have, I'm friends with a guy who's 79 and he surfs every day yeah. and my dad's 80 and he can barely walk. And, you know, and I'm looking at this guy going, wow, like how's that? And he didn't do anything special. He just seems like very, you know, he's very happy and content with what he has. And he doesn't, uh, he, he has a lot of strong friendships with people. Mm -hmm. And so that seems like a good example of, of something that kind of proves that point. Yeah. yeah, I think you see that a lot in, in with kind of like a tribal clan types of places where they've got their crew, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Through life with yeah. their crew and they take care of the elderly, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. With the relationships part and then the sense of meaning and purpose in Japan and Japanese, there's a term called ikigai, I think is what it is, ikigai. which is just mm -hmm. ikigai, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is really cool. What is my sense of my mission and my purpose? And uh, I think a lot of people who do what you do, Dr. Ruth, they'll have that, right? You're a healer and the things that you talked about, your interest in doing some different things too. We all need more of that for sure. For sure. So I'm going to ask you a few quick questions. These are kind of what I put into the fun category of questions. And then we'll okay. lead into kind of the, the last question that I always like to land on and end with. So here we go. Okay. If you won $10 million tomorrow, what would you spend it on? And definitely mission-based, you know, professionally based. Easy. I mean, I would open up a public. My wife opened up a sort of like concierge medicine practice for that's not exactly what it is, but that's sort of the concept that most people know what that is. And so, you know, the only unfortunate part of that is it, it, it only applies to people who can afford it. So we've already have a dream of raising money to do this, where we want to open a similar practice, but have it be like $10 a mm -hmm. month. So there's a tiny bit of buy-in, but it's basically free and have it for the community, especially in the West side of our Island, which really could use some help with getting healthier. Mm -hmm. The things we were talking about eating, mostly diet, you know, honestly, but treating blood pressure, diabetes, learning how to eat better, learning how to shop here and spend a limited budget on good food and that kind of thing. So hiring a, a dietitian, hiring some nurse practitioners, renting a clinic space where we could do all of this. That's definitely what I would want to mm -hmm. do. Awesome. What would you write about if you had to write a book tomorrow? I guess I would write about my... I've had an idea, which I haven't followed through on, of keeping a journal about really interesting, emotionally, I guess, interesting cases that have I come across. And so that, you know, maybe vignettes of 10 to 20 patients that I've come across over the years and telling their stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Coming out of that and looking at those stories collectively, what's a common myth about your job or the work of a hospitalist? I think most people are good. You know, I see that every day and, and you watch the news and you don't think that and you come across a few people here and there and you might think everyone's bad. But I mean, I see horrible things happen to good people and you see how resilient they are. And a funny note on that is I have had the most gratitude taking care of patients who have died under my mm -hmm. care. You know, you think, oh, you saved someone's life. That's so great. And yeah, that is great if you, you know, save someone's life. But, you know, I've had families come up to me with the most gratitude when I've helped one of their family members die in a way that was with grace, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, I mean, it. people do take that for granted, the power of the cycle of life, which includes welcoming it as well as departing and saying goodbye and doing so with grace, as you said, I think is such an important factor. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. We have such a avoidance of death to the point where we don't even talk about it or experience it. I mean, I, I don't think a typical person sees someone die in their whole life, mm -hmm. maybe, and maybe once or twice, but I see it every week. And not that that's easy or fun, but my point is, it, like you said, it's part of life. Mm -hmm. You know, death and taxes happen to everyone. <laughs> and so uh, 
I, I, I think it's an unhealthy avoidance of the topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing I'll say is you can tell the families that are, that are functional, quite functional, mm -hmm. because when one of their members dies, you can just, you sense it, right? Like people are smiling and they're getting along. And even though it's tragic, if they have cancer or whatever it is, there's this feeling of sort of gratitude for what they've experienced. Sure. Yeah. And you see that at those kind of darkest moments, you see people's best, the, the best part of them comes mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. What is one of the most important lessons you've learned over your career or through your career? Probably just staying humble. Mm -hmm. I mean, this job humbles me every week. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't be arrogant, but you need to be confident when you're making like life and death decisions and, and you, you have to balance that with being humble mm -hmm. and realizing that you're never always going to be right and you're going to keep making mistakes. Just trying to learn from them and not, not be embarrassed by them, I mm -hmm. guess. What would you say is one of the most underrated tools that's absolutely indispensable for your job? Underrated? Yeah. I mean, I guess the nurses, I mm. mean, because they're crucial. Mm -hmm. And I think most of my colleagues do this, but like if there's some doctors who don't even talk to the nurses and it's like, mm -hmm. well, you're never going to take good care of your patient if you don't talk to the nurse because they really know what's going on. They, they spend all day with the patient. Mm -hmm. Nurses can make or break a situation for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. A fun question. Another fun question. What occupation other than your own would you like to try? Mm. <laughs> At this point? <laughs> no uh, bar is held. <laughs> well, I do have my own podcast where I talk about cryptocurrency and NFTs. So maybe that would, maybe that's what it uh -huh, would be. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's pretty fun. I enjoy it. I did it. I did it yesterday and it's fun. I enjoy it. <laughs> nice. Nice. There, and you do have other hobbies as well. You mentioned surfing. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably my favorite thing to do whenever I have time to do it. It's, it's one of those things where I try to do it regularly. And in the summer when there's more waves here, I do, I definitely do it several times a week right. in the winter. It's more sparse. And so I'll get in a rut where I don't go for a couple of weeks. And then when, every time I go, I'm like, oh, this is the best. Like, why don't I do this more? But mm -hmm. uh, there's just something about, you're very present. You're, there's nothing else to really worry about. And you're in a beautiful place. Usually I run into people I know and like, and it's kind of like meditation for mm -hmm. me, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That's awesome. Okay. And resources. What resources, given the limitations, of course, that you've discussed and mentioned, would you recommend to people First and foremost, patients, individuals suffering, working through their recovery journey, and then second, loved ones and family members, what resources would you recommend? It's kind of hard because I've, as I mentioned, they're limited. limited. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to have sort of an arsenal of a few online resources for addiction and also for basically just diabetes, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that I could be familiar with to, to refer patients mm -hmm. to. We used to have a diabetes educator and even, we even lost her. I mean, keeping people employed here is hard because it's so expensive to live mm -hmm. here. So, I mean, it's pretty limited. We do have a program that's a charity that has three gyms on the mm -hmm. island that's free for teenagers. Mm -hmm. And their whole philosophy is keeping teenagers busy and uh, active so that they don't do stupid mm -hmm. stuff like do drugs. That's a good resource that I'm trying to get my son to go do more. He likes to, I mean, so I guess exercising programs that kind of encourage that, especially with, with adolescents and teenagers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Starting early, essentially intervention and psychoeducation early, it sounds like is, is a good key to being preventative. Wonderful. All right. And I'll end with what does recovery mean to you? I mean, to me, I guess it kind of means rewiring your brain and, and completely changing the way you live life. And it's all about, I think about that a lot because I'm, a, I'm surrounded by people as we've talked about for the last hour. It would only really click when you all of a sudden wake up one day and you realize that instead of thinking about it, well, I have to do this so that later on this happens. And then you switch your mindset to, no, this is, I'm doing this because I want to do this. Like, this is actually what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Like I have my own version of it. Like I used to eat total junk food and then I gave up 
most of it, not all of it. I'm not like a monk or anything, but, and I remember at first it was like, well, I really want that. I really want that, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to drink a Coke. I used to always drink a Coke in the afternoon. And then there was one day where I walked by the vending machine and I looked at it and I went gross. Like who would ever want to drink that? It's disgusting. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of happens. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But you have to kind of force yourself to do it first. And then later, all of a sudden, it's like, well, this is how I'm living my life now. And it actually, I've changed, you know, mm -hmm. so I guess that's kind of what it means to me. Yeah. Sounds like sticking to it, being consistent and committing to it for yourself. Yeah. Is, is yeah. Consistency, mm -hmm. but realistic consistency, right? Like you can't be mm -hmm. only certain people can be a hundred percent black and white, right? Like some people if you're trying to get someone to eat healthier, you can't say you can never eat a cookie ever. Like, okay, maybe you can have one here and there, but just eat 90% less cookies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Cliff. Did you have any other questions? No, no, it was a, a, a privilege and a pleasure to spend some time with you, Dr. Rosenthal. Thanks so much for making time for yeah. us. Oh, sure. Yeah, that was enjoyable. I, I had a good time. Thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to talking to you again soon.